fun to play every day to beat levels and collect new characters to constantly boost your playing power. I got my sister-in-law to start playing and it's so great to see my list of friends growing. More friends, more gifts. Best Fiends has thousands of levels already with new levels, events, and characters added every month. It's hours of fun right at your fingertips and you can even play offline. With over 100 million downloads and tons of 5-star reviews, Best Fiends is a must-play. Download Best Fiends free on the Apple App Store or Google Play. That's Best Friends without the R. Best Fiends. When his son was born, Dalton Prejohn said his namesake was his reason he wanted to continue to live. He said, quote, I'll tell him all the things I want to tell him. I'll tell him there's nothing on the street corners but trouble. And I'll tell him he's got to stay away from bad company. If I can keep him from following me here, that's reason enough to live, don't you think? But he didn't live, and he didn't keep his son from following in his father's footsteps to the Louisiana State Penitentiary, also known as Angola, the largest maximum security prison in the United States, situated on a former slave plantation an hour north of Baton Rouge. Dalton Jr. visited his father often during the decade they shared on this planet, always separated by something, glass or bars. I just remember he had this big full head of hair. Uh, those are some of my most pleasant mem uh, memories just coming here and see him. Coming here, I used to come here as a child and see him. Uh, he was executed when I was 10. I don't remember that day in particular. I knew that I was here, but we left way before any of the other things had uh, transpired that night. I just remember him telling, him telling me that he loved me, you know, be good and stay in school. And that's basically, you know, it. He felt the specter of his name followed him, always causing what he called a, quote, constant battle in his head between what is right and what is wrong. Like when my father was going through his ordeal, even, ordeal, even before he was executed, I had little instances at school where, you know, the kids, you know, kids watch television all the time and they're like, well, you know, your dad is about to be fried chicken and all this stuff here. And I'm like, well, where, where y'all getting this from? But... Nevertheless, man, I had, uh, when the stuff had happened with my dad and by me having the same name, you know, and then when, when all this stuff had really happened with my dad and they executed him and they had the funeral and stuff, you know, I, I just carried a, a, a shame-based identity because I had the same exact name as my father. And when people would call my name, you know, I, I, would, I would put my head down because I was, I was ashamed of what I believed that name had meant. And it didn't matter how much uh, good I tried to do. In the back of my mind, I was, or uh, something was always telling me that you, you're gonna end up in jail. You're gonna be in, in big trouble, you know, and accompanied with, 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 the, with, the, with the, how can I say this, with the, with the anger of, you know, of losing my father and the things that I was going through as a child I, I, I shut down at some point as, as, a young, as a young man. As a young adult, he had kids, and a restraining order was awarded against him by the mother of one of them. A domestic violence incident took place in November 1999, and Dalton was charged with second-degree battery. In October of 2000, he pled guilty in return for a deal that gave him five years supervised probation, plus anger management and domestic violence education classes. But the judge poo-pooed that scenario, withdrawing Dalton's plea and reducing his charge to misdemeanor simple battery the very next day. With drug charges pending as well, he was instead sentenced to two years unsupervised probation, in his second year on probation, Dalton Jr. married a woman named Sabrina and became a stepfather to an infant boy named Markel. The couple wed on May 18, 2001, the 11th anniversary of Dalton Prejean Sr.'s execution. Jr. was now 21 years old. Five months later, the newlyweds moved into Il Decan Apartments in Lafayette, Louisiana. 
After 10 days in their new residence on October 15, 2001, that voice in Junior's head telling him he'd be in big trouble one day finally rang true in the most tragic of ways. That anger and rage he says he always felt broke through and was unleashed upon his young stepson, Markel. Police responded to a 911 call made around 10 p.m., resulting in Dalton Prejean Jr.'s arrest on an attempted murder charge. 14-month-old Markel was still alive. Investigators gave him the news that the baby was brain dead the following evening while his interview took place. He was shaken and visibly upset, requesting to give the remainder of his confession from his knees. There had been previous instances of abuse against Markel, and Dalton described choking, slapping, and punching the baby before. That Monday night, the baby wouldn't stop crying and Dalton told police that he was shaking the baby and he just, quote, lost it. The autopsy revealed a death by head trauma and blunt force trauma to the abdomen. 14-month-old Markel Broussard had been shaken and stomped to death. At first, to be honest, I didn't know what I was going to do. I didn't want to hear nothing about the Bible. I didn't want to hear... All I wanted to know, when was I going to get out of jail? But when that reality was like, man, it's a possibility that you will never get out of jail, I said, well, what, what, what am I going to do? I have this, this crime that I have committed that, man, it's, 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 it was sickening to my heart that I would actually have done something like that. To move past that point, it was, it was very hard because, you know, it was someone that I knew, someone that I loved, you know. He wasn't my son, but technically I was responsible for him and his well-being because I'm married to his mother. The defense quickly requested a mental competency evaluation as it seemed that Dalton had no interest in discussing his case with his attorneys. Finding his mental state deteriorating quickly, the examination was completed, but he was found competent. He pled not guilty by reason of insanity and ultimately received a sentence of 60 years to life. While participating in the NBC News Justice for All initiative in the fall of 2019, Dalton spoke extensively with anchor Lester Holt, the source of the clips we've been hearing. Although Dalton Jr. had known his father and saw him early on the day of his execution, he had never heard his father's final words until he was in prison. This is nothing is going to be accomplished. I have peace with myself. I like to thank all of those who supported me all these years. I also like to thank my loved ones for being strong. My son will be a better person for not letting something like this bring down his life. Keep strong. Keep pushing, keep praying. They said it wasn't for revenge, but it's hard for me to see, to understand. I hope they're happy. So I forfeit my life and give my life. <laughs> give my love to all. God bless. Yeah, I, I would have liked to have been there. I think if I was there to hear that with regarding to the question that you asked me earlier, I believe if I was there to hear that, I think that would have uh, silenced that voice in the back of my head that's saying that, man, you're going to wind up in jail like your daddy. You didn't hear about this statement. See, no. these words until you were already here. Yeah, I was, I was here and then uh, when, I, when I read that, I'm like, it was like my daddy was, was, was was coming alive to me all over again. You know, when I when I was like that 10-year-old child again, and I'm like, why didn't I see or, or know about this up until till now? On March 1, 2005, the U.S. Supreme Court overruled the 1989 Stanford versus the state of Kentucky decision, making 16- and 17-year-olds eligible for the death penalty. 
The high court decision here was in Roper v. Simmons and concluded that societal consensus had shifted against the practice of executing offenders who committed their crimes as a juvenile. They determined that such sentences violated both the Eighth and Fourteenth Amendments, as well as America's evolving standards of decency. They found that, quote, when a juvenile offender commits a heinous crime, the state can exact forfeiture of some of the most basic liberties, but the state cannot extinguish his life and his potential to attain a mature understanding of his own humanity. The last juvenile executed in this country was Scott Allen Hain on April 3, 2003, in the state of Oklahoma. He died by lethal injection for the murders of Michael Houghton and Laura Sanders. On October 6, 1987, Scott Hain, then 17, was waiting with an accomplice to rob a home when they spotted the pair, sitting in a car in a Tulsa parking lot. They carjacked Michael and Laura at knife and gunpoint, eventually forcing each into the trunk. They then set the car ablaze with the couple alive and trapped inside. Haynes' accomplice, who was 21 at the time of the murders, also received the death penalty. His sentence was commuted to life in prison in 2005. As I mentioned earlier, the elder Dalton Prejean was the first juvenile offender executed following 1989's Stanford v. the State of Kentucky decision. Kevin Stanford's death penalty sentence was eventually commuted to life by the governor of Kentucky in 2003, the same year Scott Hain was executed, the final inmate to die for crimes committed as a juvenile. Though Kevin Stanford's murder of Babelpour paved the way for other juvenile offenders to die at the hands of their state, he still sits in prison. And in April 2019, a judge denied his motion to add the possibility of parole to his commuted life sentence. His attorney had argued that at 38 years, Stanford had already served more time than he would have even received in 2019. He's now 56 years old and is housed at Lee Adjustment Center in Beattyville, Kentucky, and has been incarcerated for 39 years. The Supreme Court's 2005 decision in Roper v. Simmons abolished the practice of sentencing juveniles to death, likely for good. The High Court's decisions in Graham v. the State of Florida in 2010 and Montgomery v. the State of Alabama in 2016 continued the momentum of appropriate sentences, leading to the resentencing of juveniles across the country, including our friend of the show, Antonio Esprit. So the fears that I had, you know, and the embarrassment that I felt with, with, with that, with uh, being incarcerated, in the same prison where my father died, it no longer re re resides in me as something that is uh, shameful. What, what, what happened now, I've used that negative energy and all that stuff in the back of my mind that was causing me to, that I've allowed to cause me to not be a good person. I've used that and transformed into positive energy and prepared and pre just kept pushing forward just kept pushing forward and even though the light at the tunnel seems like it's maybe 20 to 40 years from now you know I'm gonna still do what I have to do to continue to show people that I'm a better person because I'm coming in contact with a whole lot of men who are actually going right back into society so if I can help in that aspect I'm actually contributing to public safety through them and if I ever get the chance to return to society it, I will be a, a, a great asset to to everyone that that comes across my path because my, my heart is is, is, is is set on on helping people you know that there's nothing uh, superficial about me I, I, I willingly share my heart, you know, I really share what I have, you know, and I really am remorseful and really sorry for what I've done, and, and 
I give my life to others because that that's the way that I give back. That's the way that I give back. As always, thanks for listening. Stay tuned for a promo from Mike Morford, who you know is Morph. We'll hear about